Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is the poet Hank Lazar. Lazar is the author of 32 books of poetry and is the winner of the Harper Lee Award for Alabama's Distinguished Writer. His latest books are more personal and topical than usual, including the new COVID Sutras. I spoke with Hank Lazar in Studio UA in the Digital Media Center on the campus of the University of Alabama. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, Don. Good to be here. The last time that you and I spoke was a f great day. You had just won the Harper Lee Award in Monroeville. And it, I, I was moved a little at how much it meant to you to, to have won the Alabama Distinguished Writer Prize. It was a huge surprise and a real sense of, of acceptance. Since I've lived here since 1977, and the writing that I do is experimental, innovative work, and so it's not something that I expected at all. And it was a real sweet, sweet moment. And so now you're a bona fide Alabamian, right? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> well, not you are. I mean, insofar as we will ever become natives, we, right. you cannot become native. You can just live here a long time. Right. But you've taken an additional step. You, you, not since you retired, you you are now also involved in country life. True. What, what, tell me, you you have a place out near the Mississippi border? Yeah, a little way, about 15 minutes outside of Carrollton, with its population of 990. And uh, my wife, through her father Dab, and through her uncle Cooter inherited a farm, 200 acre farm, Duncan Farm, outside of Carrollton. And so we spend time there uh, letting the dogs run. And best of all, we're not the ones who have to farm it. We have a cousin who's been farming it for a long time and raising cattle and taking care of the property. So we go there and it's a place of real relaxation. And, and are just you getting to know the neighbors? Yeah, well, there, there are hardly any neighbors. It's, <laughs> it's <laughs> dirt and gravel roads. And there are uh, two neighbors and a busy day, maybe three cars go by. Beautiful place. Our colleague, Tom Rabbit, lived in the country outside of yeah. Tuscaloosa for years and years and years. And, and he professed that he was buddies with all his neighbors, but I always wondered if his neighbors knew he was a professor, knew he was a poet, knew anything about him. And I've had those discussions with our, with our main neighbor, Jerry, whose house is not too far away uh -huh. from ours. And Jerry's a part-time preacher uh, Pentecostal. And yeah, I've told him about my own Buddhist and Jewish practices and that I write poetry. And it seems to be fine. You know, and we have really, really good rapport and look out for one another. That, that part seems to be steady. Yeah. I have neighbors in the country and it's live and let live. We all right. just get right. along. Right. In the country, I don't think it matters where you are. My understanding is uh, I've looked at poems of yours and they have a date line and it'll say Hong Kong or <laughs> right, <laughs> something. Right. Wherever you are, you write. Mm -hmm. You write when? I write typically in the early morning. Uh -huh. I'm an early morning person in terms of reading, writing, have kind of a ritual of uh, meditation, taking care of three dogs and a cat early in the morning, seeing what they permit in terms of my daily routine. But I do write just about every morning. And it's also linked to reading. I, I learned early on from the first poetry teacher I had, Tom Gunn, at Stanford in the 60s. He really taught us to blur the activities of reading and writing. And that really keeps one going, stimulated, I always find something interesting to read, and I'm always reading several books at once. So you, in a sense, you write every day? Just about, just right. about. And so what you're saying, yeah, I, I decided I've always been putting date and location for the work. Yeah. Because I think that does influence what comes out. And I, I'm just curious to see what happened at particular times. Right. Yeah. I, I write Cottondale after some of my pieces, but mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to impress anybody very much. <laughs> so I'll let it go. The actual work that you do, the, the poems, 
the COVID sutras, which we're going to talk about, mm -hmm. are, look much more conventional. Mm -hmm. But anyway, never mind the look. Let's hold off on the, the visual for a moment. I sense, and little bits and conversation that we've had, that, that you are uh, in, a, in a tradition that goes back to Kerouac and way earlier, that is almost of first thoughts or best thoughts, spontaneous writing is more authentic than revised writing. Is that fair? When you're, when you're writing in the morning, you're, mm -hmm. especially the, the shape writing, the shape yeah. writing yeah. is that a one time through? Yes, those have to be one time through, and it's, it's akin to free jazz improvisation. Uh -huh. Your moment, you, you get your 16 bars or 32 bars to play, and you see what you can do. Or like calligraphy, there's really not a way to do it again. But it doesn't yeah. mean that each thing is good. And it doesn't mean that each thing is wonderful. It's just a commitment to that moment. Also, I'm not so sure. Revision can also be creative and spontaneous in its own way. And I'm exploring that some now. So I would sort of, you know, it's like when you come to a fork in the road, take it. I would take both sides of that either or <laughs> that course. you just gave me. And that primarily I've been doing, I've, I've been on the side of sort of first thought, best thought, but now I do more revision. What I am committed to is inventing forms and inhabiting those forms rather than a received form and working with the invented form until I get bored with it or feel like I'm becoming repetitive. Right. Well, I think of this, it, it, this is, Jack Kerouac was not a Californian, but he became the most famous of the, of the first draft writers, that is, on the road was supposed to have been written in one on one long roll of uh, of uh, uh, shelf paper, and then I think the Dharma bombs was actually written on a roll of of um, telegraph uh -huh. telegram paper, yeah. and when he took it to the publisher, he rolled it down the down the center of the corridor, <laughs> what? and they looked at it. But that's a different that's a different yeah. business. Well, and I've also written in one place, first thought, worst thought. So I, I don't think it's necessary. I actually think first thought, best thought applies in two places for sure. Restaurants, when you're deciding what to order oh. and, w and when you're shopping so that you don't leave and say, oh, I should have bought that sweater that first caught my eye. So I would really endorse those in those two locations. In poetry, do what you need to do. First thought might be best thought, but the other thing that, that comes up it, in, in, in a sense of, in the sense of um, how one organizes the world. Um, you, you and others have accused me of being essentially bipolar, <laughs> which I know is a medical term. Okay. But, but that is to say a, 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 ki a kind of a, uh, a kind of either or kind of thinker. And, yeah. and I, I've thought a lot about that. Maybe it's true. And for you though, the difference for you, it's perpetual dialogue. And I was just thinking about, mm -hmm. here you are in Alabama, the home of the New Testament. When your emotional life is spent in the Torah and the difference between them is, is everything, as I, as I understand it, the New Testament is the word. Mm -hmm. It's received, it's the last word. Whereas the Torah is what? Well, I'm actually not terribly immersed in the Torah, except as th in the way you're describing it. The Torah is also a launching off point for conversation. Yeah. So you have the Talmud and Mishnah, which are endless commentaries. Maybe I meant Talmud. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, I did. Yeah. Yes. And so that's, that's a Jewishness and a part of Jewish culture that I absolutely embrace. And you're right, in the poetry, there's often quoted material from what I'm reading at the time. And it isn't necessarily to reinforce my own writing. It's part of a conversation that's going on on the page or different, almost like different vectors or different spaces of thought that occupy the same page. Right. Perpetual reinterpretation of ancient text. Right, right. And that's a classically Jewish scholarly assumption that there's no end to the conversation. Right, and right, right, right. If we're a people of the book, we're as much a people of the question. So the classic, why does a Jew answer a question always with a question? I don't know oh. why. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right, these, the poems that are shape poems, mm -hmm. we, we need, I, I'd like you to read one or two of the, of the quick, of the, okay. of the, of the more 
accessible ones, physically accessible. I mean, and then we and we will be putting these on the screen for okay. for viewers at home to have an idea of what it is you're doing. Well, first of all, I think they actually turn out to be more accessible than than one might imagine. It's there's a certain physical fun in the reading of the poems yes. because you're having to turn the page. So the first one I'll, I'll read is from five nine eleven, so ten years ago. And it really is a fusion of Buddhist and Jewish thinking. So in the upper left, we see the, the phrase Adonai Echad, which is the end of the holiest of Jewish prayers, meaning the Lord is one. The shape on the page is a, like a numerical one with a quote running across it. So reading the one, we are beings uniquely placed in language, a language we had no hand in making. And the quotation that goes across it from Levinas is, after the glimpse of holiness, which is primary, and in the lower right from uh, a Buddhist chant, Shin Ku Myo Yu, from true emptiness, the wondrous being appears. So these all coexist on that particular page. Let's see, I'll read you one other as well. So often they don't take a long time to read, but the reader has a chance to begin where you want it's a collaborative process. There isn't a right or wrong place to start a reading. Well, I've, I've, I've wrote a note to myself and said this is reader participation. Absolutely, <laughs> or, or collaboration. That, <laughs> oh. yeah, sort of like the freeze-dried food you take on a camping trip. If you don't add the boiling water, it's not so good. And, and what these pages <laughs> require is that reader's participation. So I'll read this one that moves around. And again, I've had friends of mine reading the book. A friend in San Francisco was reading it in a bar, sitting around. People gave him a strange look as he's reading, you know, like this. But yeah. it's a fun physical activity. Round and round, reading around one day, one morning, a gray day, crepe myrtle putting forth first leaves of spring, dogwood beginning to blossom, sounds of a possible storm, reading around and you come across it, a passage, everything changes. I am still in motion, 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 a passage. You come across it, a passage, everything changes, but for how long? So if someone takes a look at that page, I didn't read it one time. I, 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 in the moment, <laughs> I'm still responding to the possibilities of the page, and there are always multiple ways to read any particular page. Right, right. Let me read one more, if time to read one yeah, more, you think? Well, that's, this one is, on the page, looks a little bit more elaborate. You'll eventually we'll see that up uh -huh. more up close. And what really gets fun with these with the shape writing is to have multiple readers, have three or four people taking different strands or asking in a poetry reading, put it up, how would you like to read this? And so we can invent a way. This one is from London 71611 for the poet Fanny Howe. She and I were able to read together at an old pub Damp day, rain as it should be here. Aging, far away. We move, we move on. We move through together. His rhythm and hers, specific music, speaking of each. Faith and unfaith, Anna. She went fishing with him above, before, and again. The idea of God is God in me, but it is already God breaking up the consciousness that aims at ideas, already differing from all content. The extraordinary course of a thought proceeding to the point of the breakup of the I think. Which again is something that fascinates me in writing is, is reaching and in meditation is reaching that point where thinking or content or theme dissolves, which I think is a kind of realism. I, I don't think our daily lives or an hour of our lives are particularly thematic or coherent. No. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, I think of those, those poems as more you. Mm -hmm. Your newest book, though, the COVID Sutras, mm -hmm. Sutras is obviously a, a, a Buddhist, allusion 
But I think of the poetry in that book as less typical of mm -hmm. you because it really is responsive, temporal, immediate. It is about what's been going on in, the, in America, I guess the world, but in, in our case, in America for the last year and a half. And uh, obviously you responded to the pandemic. Your response was a book of poetry. Yeah, and, and you're right in terms, the form is different, the voice is somewhat different. I think the concerns there still is a kind of continuity. I don't think I've necessarily lost myself, but the shape writing reached an end. I had been practicing it for about 13 years, yep. and suddenly I found myself writing quatrains. Right, right. I thought, what is this? I, first, of all, I thought, that's ridiculous. But the form really appealed to me. So I spent, I, I wrote a lot during the early phase of the pandemic, and so in, I wrote for three and a half months for this particular book, and I sent it to a publisher friend asking what to do, and he sent me page proofs three hours later. Obviously, he was taken by it, and this book came out very quickly, short after, shortly after it had been written. Mm -hmm. Would you like me to read a little? You're, like you're going to make uh, aspiring poets crazy with that story. The poets who send their manuscript out and then 12 months later get a rejection. Well, or an acceptance, <laughs> and two years later it comes yeah. out. So that was, the ish, that was my question to my friend. What the heck do I do with this? It, it has a certain immediacy and right. timeliness Well, to he it. saw that too. He did, right. And <laughs> yeah. so he went ahead and yeah. made it into and, a book. And the poems move from, in a sense, they move through the pandemic. Right. From, from early days until the very last of the poems are approaching unmasking, approach, oh, not quite, but approaching yeah. the end, end of the plague. Well, it, it's still, it's in June of last year. Yeah. So we never quite knew what was going right, on or right. what, was, what change was going on. And then once the pandemic itself is allowed in as content, then there was so much else going on. The Trump administration, the murder of George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. And so the, I think the question of the book becomes, how does one maintain openness and balance through the situation? Extremely challenging. Uh, Buddhist priest, poet friend of mine, Norman Fisher, said, as very various ones of us were having a tough time coping with all these circumstances, that your happiness is your own responsibility. And so I think it's out of that spirit that the COVID-19 Sutras is yeah. written. Well, let's, let's hear some of them. Sure. So these are uh, relatively short and punchy. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll read through a kind of span of them here, beginning with the epigraph, which comes from Dogen, who is a 13th century Zen philosopher, priest, said, you have gained the pivotal opportunity of human form. Do not use your time in vain. You are maintaining the essential working of the Buddha way. Who would take wasteful delight in the spark from the flint stone? Besides, form and substance are like the dew on the grass. Destiny, like the dart of lightning, emptied in an instant, vanished in a flash. But I love that you have gained the pivotal opportunity of human form. So this book is an asking of, well, now what do we do? Can one be steadfast now, see clearly and with joy at dawn, a male and female cardinal at the bird feeder and the red azaleas blooming along the fence line, all this before you check the daily death count? I am ready to become something else. Am I really dissolve, dissolute? to face or turn away from, who said or? This is it, and when the virus hit, can we change or does connection break away? We hurry to find a cure, we hurry to find a vaccine, we hurry to assign blame, we want to know its gene sequence, we want to intervene. Some cities are reopening, in others the virus has barely arrived, and again, we are not equal to the task. The liar is a buffoon. Let this huckster inject bleach into himself. The herd immunity we need is to him. We stand exposed to the virus, yes, and to our own incited fears. Because everything now occurs under the sign of the coronavirus, I wear this mask for you. It is the least that I can do. Same goes for gloves and the distance between us and what we do through this poem. 
The visitor insinuates himself among us. He is not from here, not from now. He is not familiar with our ways. Cast a cold eye on life. Cast a cold eye on death. Horsemen fly by. It is not exactly how you remember it. The visitor cannot understand what we do to one another. He cannot understand why we make such a big deal about our different appearances. Who can name the trees and birds in your own backyard? She is very afraid, but she still has a job and benefits. We call them heroes and essential, but we will not pay them a living wage, nor will we keep them safe. The orange-faced liar with raccoon eyes says, vaccine or no vaccine, we're back. Put your thumbs up and honk your horns. Bar graphs and pie charts serve daily. Just how much can you stand to know? Now, that's, that is not a typical Hank Lazar poem, but, um, but it's a good one. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, the ine inevitable anger and confrontation is, is somewhat necessary. I'll read the concluding two pages as well. Sure. So at that point, we're really in the midst of Black Lives Matter and the reaction to George Floyd's death. Yes, shattered glass, burning buildings, these are the voices of the unheard mixed in with others intent on something else. In the 1960s, they had infiltrated every group I was a part of. Where is the FBI now? The orange-faced liar stays in his bunker. Around midnight, his anger bubbles over and he hammers out a string of incendiary tweets. Who calls for calm must be a practitioner of same. After sitting, then again, wake to the world and go out into it, some masked, many not, each imagining and living in a different reality, perhaps as it had been well before this happened. The liar makes it simple. Keep the economy going, protect buildings and businesses, attack those who disagree. If you do not take care of yourself, what else can you do? A sentence still contains within it a poem. Laughter happens as it should. Who was the man who died and who was his killer? Ask the one with eyes and hands, ask the one whose heart is breaking, ask the one who hears their cries, rest in the openness of mind. So that the words equality, justice, democracy, mark something other than our shame. Pain goes straight to our emptiness. Repeated videos enshrine the victims. What to do with two viruses? Death of a nation, blurred as I age, into what's next. Well, that um, puts the hay down where the horses can reach it, I think. I've <laughs> <laughs> never heard that description of, of my writing, but I, I like it a it's lot. A, it's sort of Gary Snyder-ish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's somebody I was able to meet a couple of times. Oh, and, I'm sure, yes. Admired his life path. You've, I would, as you were reading, I was thinking to myself, I, I, I've spent more time with those poems that book of poems that I've probably spent with any book of poems in quite a long time. Thank you. And, and, and got a kick out of it, partly because they, they I'm in harmony mm -hmm. <laughs> with a mm -hmm. lot of the, of, the, uh, of the sentiments and the topicality and so on. And if my happiness is my own responsibility, I, have to I had to turn off the news, sure. but I could not. I could not. No, I had to periodically as well turn off the news or ration my ingesting of it because it was so frustrating and difficult. That's why also throughout the book, daily living becomes our way of coping. You live in a beautiful, quiet place as well. I can't tell you how many of my friends began to know what the birds were in their backyard uh -huh. or uh -huh. a critic friend in outside of Los Angeles. She said, I now start to know the names of the trees in my yard. People began to see the kind of salvific nature of where one lives. Even and small was, nature, too. Yes. Even, even, yes. even, even the nature of the, of the, of the uh, balcony uh, in an apartment. If birds come and sit, suddenly you notice them in a way that you didn't before. Right. A lot of your poetry has been translated. Mm -hmm. uh, Spanish, I know. French, I know. Chinese, Chinese. A, a fair amount in China, yeah, a good bit in Chinese, or selected poems in China. What do you hear back? How, well, how does it, I, I, I assume the shape poems don't get translated? They, well, actually, we've done that a little <laughs> bit in uh, publication in Cuba. It is, it's very hard to do, and the shape 
gets changed because there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence of word to word. No. And even rewriting a shape, I can't do it exactly the same. Yeah. So that's why I just live with that one. Sometimes you get interesting questions and some poems are not translatable. I had one that said uh, in, in 18, a poem a day keeps the doctor oive. <laughs> so that's not translatable puns, into Chinese. Puns don't translate. Right. I mean, they just, they right. never have. Sometimes the translation, though, has its own beauty, which may even exceed the original. So with the Italian poetry, my, we went on Skype for about two years going over every line and poem. And the translator said, at the end of this, you'll now know Italian. And it sounded prettier to me, but she thought it had too many oh, words all the time. Yes. I, um, on occasion, I'll go to a poetry reading where I remember especially a, a, a Russian poet came to town and he read his poems in Russian, and then I think one of our friends. Yeah, this might have been Joseph Brodsky's reading. It was Brodsky, yeah. and one of our colleagues then read the English translation, and I thought, I didn't understand a word of the Russian, but I liked it better. Yeah, no, there's, yeah. there's, a, there's a musicality inherent <laughs> yes, right. in the source language that's really hard to reproduce. And I've done translations from poetry that's written in Spanish. It's, it's, uh, yeah. You lose some of it, it's but you create something else. It's another story. Well, you never stop, so I, I know that um, you're working on something and there's something for everybody to look forward to. What, what is the next chapter? Well, a few things. I'm finishing a book called Field Recordings of Mind in Mourning, M-O-R-N-I-N-G. Right. Mainly short meditative poems, a lot of them written at Duncan Farm. And then we're also doing uh, musical improvisation versions with Holland Hobson on banjo. And we've got 15 tracks completed for that. So the book will have QR codes in it, and you can immediately jump to YouTube for those. And then I'm writing, I just am finishing up a very long poem. My mother passed away a little over two weeks ago, and I've written a long kind of death watch poem for her that uh, deals with the last couple of months of sitting with her and being with her. And then I'm just writing, and I don't understand the direction of my writing while I write. Mm. After a period of time, I look back and say, well, what was, it, what was I thinking about? And then that begins to shape whatever a next book will be. So I just, I just trust in the writing and let the writing be an exploration. And a lot of, it's kind of like a tryouts for a baseball team. A lot of those poems aren't gonna make the team. They'll get sent down to the minors <laughs> or told, pursue another career. <laughs> sent down to the round metal right. minors. Right, right. <laughs> well, that's great. I have no doubt that you will persevere <laughs> because you always have and I appreciate this opportunity thank you I, I, I not only have a good time when I talk to you but I, I, I get the feeling perhaps false that I've learned something <laughs> <laughs> well in, in, in the same way I appreciate the fact that the way you read my poetry is your own particular approach to it more grounded in your extensive reading in fiction and so I, va I know I always I value that different perspective and freshness of the approach, and I learn from it as well. I see and hear things that I hadn't heard before. So I thank you, and I thank you for this opportunity. Before too long passes, we'll do it again. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs>